Welcome to the Who, What, Why podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Sheckman. The federal government may have averted fiscal disaster, but what about state and local governments that can't print money, can't in most cases raise their debt ceiling, but often have to rely on the federal government for a handout? If you're old enough, you might recall a famous 1975 headline in the New York Daily News, Ford to New York, Drop Dead. It was a time when New York City was teetering on the edge of a fiscal cliff. While President Ford later claimed that he never actually uttered those words, the sentiment underscored a reality that still resonates today, the reliance of cities and states on the federal government. Fast forward nearly 50 years. And we find ourselves again grappling with the complexities of state and local finance, urban development, and the role the federal government plays in managing local fiscal crises. To help us navigate these waters, we're joined today by a leading authority on the subject, my guest, David Schleicher. David is a professor of law at Yale Law School, and his work has been widely published in academic journals. He's been lauded as the most important thinker we have on the subject of local government. He's been praised by the economist Slate, Vox, and others for his insightful perspectives, and he is also the co-host of the podcast Digging a Hole, the Legal Theory Podcast. His latest book is In a Bad State, Responding to State and Local Budget Crises, where he provides a comprehensive analysis of the historical and theoretical responses of the federal government to local debt crises. It is my pleasure to welcome David Schleicher here to the Who, What, Why podcast. David, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Well, it is indeed great to have you here. When we look at the the state of the states today, are they in better shape or worse shape than they have been over the past decade or so with respect to their financial condition? The last few years have been, in some ways, the best years in the history of state budgets. Um, The late 2010s, um, we're a growing economic time, and state budgets are what they call pro-cyclical. State budgets do better when the economy is bad, and then they have to cut when times are bad. Um, and then COVID hit, and everyone thought there were going to be a lot of crises in local, state, and local governments. But the federal government offered a giant boatload amount of money in addition to uh, the economy never doing as badly as people thought it would. And so the result has been that state budgets have been remarkably flush. For the last couple of years. And this has affected the way politics works. So you see in liberal, even in liberal states, liberal politicians have been proposing proposing tax cuts. And in conservative states, even conservative politicians have supported raising teachers' pay. But we're about to see the worm turn. The federal money is shutting off soon. And the um, revenue projections are getting uh, worse and worse. And so we're going to see right now, how people spent their flush period. That is to say, did they use their flush period to save for the next crisis? Did they use it to address long-run budget problems like underfunded pensions? Or did they respond to the flush, the kind of one-time federal money to play uh, like the movie Brewster's Millions, spending it as quickly as they got it? Um, And we are going to see across jurisdictions that they probably did a variety of things. And so we're going to see both general cutbacks across all places because the uh, revenue picture is getting worse across states. Um, And then we're going to see in some jurisdictions, jurisdictions that use the money to uh, one time money to create long run programs, whether it's tax cuts or new new hires, are going to be in a real pickle. And in many cases, it does appear that that money was spent by politicians of both political parties because it was in their interest while they had the money to spend it for things people wanted. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we worry about for people who are uh, in the budgeting game is the time horizon of politicians. And the really politicians are only responding to the time horizon of voters. And if p- voters uh, reward politicians who do things that are good, you know, getting more teachers, getting more police, getting more services, cutting taxes, but don't pay any attention to the long run costs that creates, then politicians will have an incentive to, uh, you know, spend now and worry and let someone else who's going to be in office later uh, worry about later. And that is a structural problem with um, budgets created by us. That is to say, 
our lack of attentiveness to the future creates re- gives into politicians the incentives to spend now and worry about later later. And in tough financial times, not only are the states struggling, but the federal government is struggling and under more and more pressure because of politics to to spend less. So the federal government doesn't have to spend less. It is reasons to spend less, though. So for two reasons. One is that spending more leads to, in a tight labor market, leads to inflation. Um, uh, But a second reason is that, as you know, many politicians think we oughtn't spend more. Um, And you're seeing the a lot of federal money goes is actually grants to states. So a lot of the discretionary federal budget just got cut in or the projected growth that just got cut in the debt limit deal. Um, A lot of it actually is that what the federal government spends is then sent to states to actually spend, states and cities. Um, There's an old joke that the federal government is a military with an insurance company or insurance company with a military um, because they don't actually do anything really for the most part. Um, And states and cities do almost everything that is important and useful. And so the um, effect of that is to is that. is that states and cities, that the cuts at the federal level will harm state and city budgets. What states seem to know, though, is that with respect to any emergency costs, whether it's from natural disasters, whether it's infrastructure, whether it is things like the pandemic, that when the chips are down, they can always count on the federal government to bail them out so that there's less incentive, it seems, to put money away for those kind of emergencies. That's the downside of federal emergency aid, that the belief that states will not take their own precautions going forward. We call this moral hazard. Um, you may be familiar, people, listeners may be familiar from the idea when we thought about the, uh, this in terms of giving money to banks. It's the same idea. If you provide money to a government, they, they, it changes their incentives. Over the course of American history, the federal government has actually taken a kind of varied stance on this issue and has often let states default or force them to make giant cuts rather than offering bailouts. So one well... I say well known. It's not like Taylor Swift well known, but it's you know wellish <laughs> known. Is in the uh, in the eighteen forties, um, eight states and a and a territory defaulted on their debt um, when the federal government uh, refused to offer aid, and people had expected them to offer aid to states after, particularly after Alexander Hamilton's plan to assume state debts. Many of you may be familiar with the with Hamilton, the rap, the rap musical, where they discuss Hamilton's plan to assume state debts in Cabinet Battle Number One. The the, the rap battle that takes place in um, between Hamilton and Jefferson in that musical, um, the ha, we did in fact assume state debts in the revolutionary post-revolutionary period. And when we got to the 1840s, everyone expected the federal government to come uh, do it again. Um, uh, and particularly uh, the British and Dutch investors who had lent money to the states to uh, build canals and do banks and whatever, build, uh, build state banks. Um, and the federal government decided not to. Um, and this reduced moral hazard, but created another problem, which is that it harmed lending to states. And so you started off with the famous example of Ford to city drop debt. Well, that was an example of the federal government not, at least at first, offering aid to, a, uh, in this case, a city, but a very, very large one that was on the edge of default. One irony to that story is that so is that they didn't do so because they didn't want to create moral hazard. But in the end, the federal government, after the state city uh, went through substantial reforms due to kind of a variety of state laws, the federal government actually did offer aid through something called the Seasonal Financing Act later on. So Ford to city dropped dead is the the denouement of the story. Is that the Ford, Ford said, "Hey, wait a minute," um, but the um, the federal government has shifted its position over time and even over the course of one, one crisis will shift its position. Is there a difference that we have seen in more contemporary politics between red and blue states and the way the federal government deals with them and the way they deal with the federal government and look to the federal government for money? Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, so the there's kind of, you think might think of normal times and then crisis. So uh, in normal times, uh, uh, blue states, generally speaking, and by blue states, I don't want to say all states that vote for Democrats, but your big Californias and New Yorks um, and Massachusetts and New Jersey and Connecticut, those types of places send much more money to the federal government than they get in money back. And that's just because they're richer for the most part. Um, that the reason 
uh, New York gets much less money from the federal government than it, than it gets back is that it has um, a lot of rich people who pay a lot of income taxes, um, uh, not an overwhelming number of old people who get uh, Social Security or Medicaid, a normal num- amount, um, and it has uh, it doesn't have a ton of military bases. And so, as a kind of structural fact, that federal, the New York, the New Yorks of the world, and the Connecticut, and particularly New Jersey, give an extraordinary amount to the feds and get much less back. In contrast, you see across poorer states, and that can be both red and blue poor states, but across the South and New Mexico and a variety of other places, they're getting often getting $2 back for every dollar they send in. Um, And so that is a huge difference over time. Now, in a crisis, we see in there are a few state jurisdictions who are not exclusively blue, but are, I'd say, some of the worst ones are, are in very extremist debt so Illinois is the kind of one the the um, jurisdiction that has the kind of and jur- Illinois and Chicago and Cook County and the Chicago school system and a whole variety of related governments have some of the most extreme problems. And when they ask for money from the federal government, which they did, for instance, the head of the Illinois State State Senate asked for a bailout right at the beginning of uh, COVID. Uh, one of the responses, like, "Hey, why are you helping Illinois?" Um, Illinois it made, is the is problems are of its own own making, and on one level that's true, but on another level it's less true, and so hypocrisy abounds across red and blue states on this issue. Do you see the problem getting worse? You know, I think the the um the the problem of over indebted and uh, states and local governments is a long running American problem. It, we have fifty states and thousands of local governments. It would be weird if some of them didn't get into trouble. Like that'd just be a strange thing. Just it's a very large number. They, they're not all going to be responsible. And there are also going to be economic shocks that push some of them into crisis. And so I think the question is not like, are politicians worse today? There's one way I want to get to which they are worse, but it's a, um, but rather how can we come up with a structures to make the problems of crises a little less likely or a little less painful when they happen. And that's what the federal government should be thinking about is not how can we uh, make it so that no state or city ever faces a fiscal crisis. That would be too much to ask. Um, But instead to say, um, how can we make this problem a little less beard? Um, One way, though, I will say that it is getting worse is that uh, there's a lot of evidence that voters pay less and less attention to state and local politics. That if you ask yourself, listener, do you know who your state senator or state representative is? Do you know who represents you on the county commission? The answer is almost certainly no. Do you even know what uh, issues are in front of those bodies? And the answer, again, is almost certainly no. And that wouldn't have always been true across American history. Um, it turns out that voters in state legislative and in local legislative elections now basically just vote for the party they like for president. If you like President Biden, you vote for a Democratic state legislator. And if you vote for you like President Trump, you vote for a Republican county commissioner. And the um, effect of that is that it means that less and less of what happens in state legislatures matters to state elections. And that creates a pretty destructive on uh, politics, particularly because the people who are paying attention, who get to decide, are a very unrepresentative slice of the electorate. So it's kind of rabid primary voters or um, or interest groups who get to give a lot of money. Um, and listening to them kind of structurally leads to more spending um, or and less, you know, like less less fiscal rectitude because the those groups are kind of usually in what we call in the, call in the business intense policy demanders. They want something from government. Um, who's going to show up at a weird, uh, you know, off cycle primary election for a county commissioner? Well, got to be a little weird to do that. Um, and uh, at least in kind of contemporary politics and contemporary life. And as a result, the um, it makes sense for politicians to kind of buy these groups off. And that makes makes state and local budgets a lot, makes them worse over time. And so that's one way in which things are getting worse. But there have been crises for all of American history. One of the other things that's adding to that is the hollowing out of local news, which is one of the reasons people are less aware of what's happening in their local communities. Oh, absolutely. There's a lot of evidence that when a local newspaper closes, the cost for the government that Governments that are in that newspaper's, you know, where that newspaper is, uh, face higher borrowing costs immediately. So if you they go to want to borrow money to build a bridge, and if you don't have a local newspaper, it's going to cost you more. Well, why is that? Well, investors are not stupid. 
Um, and they surely think that governments that aren't watched by the news media are uh, going to be more wasteful, maybe more corrupt, um, and certainly less responsive and less less kind of on the ball. Um, and so uh, it's also the case that we see where newspapers close, we see less split ticket voting. That is to say, people are much more likely to vote for the same party for president and state legislature in places that don't have local newspapers. And the nationalization of news, um, as uh, uh, my friend Daniel Hopkins wrote in his wonderful book, The Increasingly, Increasingly United States, has, sh is, has a huge effect on the nationalization of politics. And again, that's in part due to kind of uh, the right, the internet, and the decline of um, the decline of uh, 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 the kind of ad, the ad revenue for local budgets, but it's also a lot. A lot result is kind of responding to demand, which is that people are often quite more interested in following, you know, whatever Donald Trump tweeted than the things that have a more direct effect in their life. And so, um, uh, the decline of local media is both pushed by structural work, but also kind of pulled by by our interests. The other factor that enters into this, we've been talking about it on, on the spend side, is the revenue side and greater and greater demand for less taxes. California perhaps being the penultimate example, going all the way back to Prop 13. Yeah, it's, um, it's no, it's, I mean, it, that, that uh, voters often demand from states uh, impossible things. They want more services and less taxes. And it's a challenge for governments to come up with a way of convincing voters that it's worth to pay taxes for the things they get. Um, and not wanting to pay taxes is a totally normal thing. I mean, who wants to pay taxes? Everyone wants to get free stuff. That's normal. Um, uh, but it is the case that uh, that doesn't work in the medium run um, or even in the short run. Uh, and so the the um, the lack of a kind of uh, uh, constitutional or other rules that for, or be, better constitutional rules that force this kind of longer run thinking um, uh, uh, plays into our weakness as voters and for as politicians. You've indicated that you thought that the amount of money that, that the federal government put out there during the COVID crisis could have been a unique opportunity for the federal government to deal with states. Talk about that. Yeah. So the federal government gave a lot of money to states, and this gives that gave them a lot of leverage. Um, states need some states need really needed the money. Other states needed it less. The amounts were probably too much in the end. Um, but it gave them a lot of leverage. And the I think the one of the tragedies of the federal money was not that they gave money because again it was it, it would be too probably too much to ask states to plan for a global pandemic. That's not or cities like it's, it's a lot to ask. Um, but. Um, uh, the federal government could have used conditions on that federal money to encourage more responsible budgeting going forward. And so here's an example. Um, states generally budget what we call a cash basis. And what does that mean? It means they count dollars in, dollars out each year. But this means that if you adopt, I'll create a liability that will hurt you in future years, it doesn't count against your whether you have a balanced budget this year. So if you um, underfund your pensions this year or fail to do maintenance on a road or engage in a tricky transaction that's going to have costs in the future, it doesn't affect whether you've balanced your budget this year. Um, other entities that budget don't behave this way because they understand that, you know, uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul is a bad idea. They engage in what we call accrual accounting. The federal government could have uh, created conditions on federal money to encourage states to budget in a more responsible manner. In fact, they still could. It would be a little harder because they have a little less leverage, but they could condition certain federal tax benefits that are given to state and local debt in order to achieve this. Um, the states have reasons not to do this. They, were, As we mentioned, politicians are worried about solving the problem today, but the federal politicians had a chance to really encourage a kind of more responsible state budgeting going forward. And they uh, whiffed. Do you sense that most state legislatures out there are, are doing the responsible thing in terms of budgeting, or is it really just about giving free stuff to the voters? You know, it's a mix. I mean, I, I have a lot of respect for state politicians. Um, it's a very hard job. Um, they are uh, state legislators, particularly, are often uh, it's a part time job. They're underpaid, they're understaffed. Um, uh, it's a really hard job. And I think that most politicians are trying to do the right thing. They got, I mean, again, I don't want you know. I, I'm not a cynic about this kind of stuff. Um, uh, I, but the it is 
a hard thing to do given voter demand for um uh for you know stuff um and uh i think what you've seen in the last couple of years is really varied outcomes so one that i'm very positive on is in the state of connecticut the state of connecticut has for most of the second half of the 20th century is kind of one of our big budget basket cases. They didn't save it all for their pensions for many, many years. Um, uh, they created an income tax and then kind of spent the money. Um, and it was a big, a big, um, a big problem. But in the last five years, they've really turned things around. They imposed some in innovative legal limits that I think that the federal government should have encouraged other states to adopt, um, uh, which is something they call bond lock and volatility caps, the details of which I can talk about if you're interested. But the um, the result has been that after years and years of either saving just enough, you know, making just enough to make their annual pension payments or and not having enough in their rainy day fund or to just save the kind of their savings account, during the pandemic, when they got this big flow of money, they really saved a lot of it. And so that's like a really positive story. Other jurisdictions, I think you see less. That That's less so. And so that may be part of due to the in politics of the state. But it may just be that the politicians in the state um, uh, are uh, taking a healthfully long view in Connecticut in, in contrast with some other places. One of the things we see around the country, and certainly California is an example, and, and, and many other states as well, you mentioned pensions before, is these huge amounts of unfunded liabilities. Yeah. So I think people misunderstand a little bit what pension obligate debt, pension underfunding is. So people often think of pension underfunding as something that's exclusively a problem about the size of pensions. But there are some jurisdictions that have very, very wealth, you know, expensive pensions that say workers get good pensions, but they're perfectly funded because the voters have decided or the politicians have decided to tax themselves to fund it. And so what is pension underfunding? Well, it's just a form of debt. It's just a form of borrowing in the sense that you have to make the payments. You are constitutionally required to make the payments. Um, so it's just like you've borrowed money. Um, uh, but one of the things about the way that most states work is they have a limit when they when they if they want to issue bonds, let's say to borrow money uh, directly, that you often have to go directly to the voters or they have a cap in the amount of bonds they can issue each year or and they have to keep an, a balanced budget. Um, the pensions are treated off books. That is to say, if you underfund your pensions or you uh, imagine you're going to get a giant return on the money you have invested in your pension, you can um, – you, uh, it doesn't count against your bond limit or whatever. Um, and this result, the legal rules result in jurisdictions you channeling their desire to run deficits into pension underfunding. And this is, in a lot of ways, a total tragedy, um, uh, the way that legal rules create these kind of incentives for politicians, because states can only borrow so much limited by the market as well as limited by their laws. And one of the things that you saw at, particularly in the post-Great Recession period is that states should have been borrowing quite a lot to build stuff. They should have, interest rates were low, unemployment was high. That's the time when you want to build giant new infrastructural marvels, your new Brooklyn bridges, your new aqueduct systems. And look back at where you live on that period. Did we do that? And the answer is we didn't. And it's because instead of using our borrowing capacity to borrow to build stuff, we used our borrowing capacity to hide deficits, our kind of annual operating deficits. And the way we hit it was through underfunding our pension system. Then the, the federal government came along once again with what has become a kind of de facto bailout with respect to infrastructure and the building of these projects now. Yeah. So the federal government added a lot of new money in the form of infrastructure, but even the federal money, um, federal government, people have a mis misunderstand what's going on with infrastructure. Infrastructure is at all times, I mean, there's some very, very few exceptions, largely funded by states and cities, not by the federal government. The federal government can increase the amount of money it spends, mostly in grants to states. But when, particularly when you take into consideration operations and, man and, and maintenance, in addition to like kind of capital costs, um, the states and cities do most infrastructure spending. And just think about it for a minute, like while it, what is infrastructure, even what is road infrastructure? You may think of the interstate highway, but most roads are the roads that lead to the interstate highways. They're the roads that go through your town, they're state roads, whatever it is. And those are built by states and cities. And so the federal government can increase money to um, to for infrastructure. Um, uh, 
one of the ironies of this period that's coming up, as I noted that budgets are getting worse, is that much of the federal effort to increase investment infrastructures, not just roads and high and, and bridges and airports, but also things like green energy transition issues, which also require a lot of infrastructure investment. Um, the federal government's going to be pushing more money in, but the states having these revenue problems are going to start pulling money out. And so states are going to frustrate some of the goals of the Biden administration. Um, there's federal laws that attempt to deal with this, what they call maintenance of effort rules um, or matching funds, a whole variety of ways the federal government tried to encourage states and cities to keep spending. But faced with, given that they're doing most of the infrastructure spending and they're facing revenue losses, they're going to pull back. And in this way, as you note, the federal spending will help them reduce their problems, but it will also come at the cost of frustrating some of the federal government's infrastructural goals. And of course, it's it's during a period right now where the borrowing costs, if they had to do that, would be so much higher. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is, again, part of the tragedy of the late of the post Great Recession period, it's like the go getting was theoretically good for a huge amount of investment. Now states and cities are going to have to borrow at higher rates to build, and so they're going to be even less incentive to uh, to um, to invest. Now this may suggest even greater federal investments. The federal government has lower borrowing costs than anybody, um, and uh, but. Um, you know, uh, we're going to I think that the, if if you're sitting around waiting for the great infrastructural investments in your town that you missed out on in the, say, early 2010s, um, I wouldn't hold my breath. I mean, there'll be some due to the new federal spending, but it's not going to be um, a period like, say, the turn of the 1800s, 1800s, which was the great period of American infrastructure development. And the broader economy and the possibility that, that we're on the precipice of a recession is is going to add to all of these problems. Yeah. I mean, I think that in some ways, the two things I'd say about that. One is the um, the that's where like the kind of declines that we're seeing in state revenue are kind of a forward signal of declining incomes, which are, uh, you know, that's what a recession is on some level. I mean, we have a weird economy right now where you know unemployment is at record lows, um, but we're seeing other types of problems. Um, and so, you know, I'm I, like everyone else, hope that it doesn't tip over and that we can kind of keep going, um, uh, keep the economy at least, you know, not landing hard. But there's obviously risks there. The other thing is that declining state revenue is one of the things that makes little recessions into very bad recessions. So, in the Great Recession. Um, what we saw was that after the federal government stopped giving money to states, states had to pull back really, really, really hard. And the decline in employment that created um, meant that uh, it was one of the big reasons why the Great Recession lasted so long. Private employment, private sector employment gets back to pre-recession period many years before uh, public sector employment does. Um, and so one of the things we're going to see in these coming state cut cutbacks is uh, it's something that is going to drag the economy. The other question in all of this is the degree to which all of the states have different revenue sources that they rely on, some property tax, some sales tax, some income tax. Talk about that. Yeah. So you see uh, states have a very a, a widely varied uh, set of revenues. Um, and you could think about this in a couple of ways. One is that um, states, uh, states and cities – uh, have so especially uh, you see this more in kind of your blue states have increasingly relied on income taxes and uh, capital gains taxes, and that is has a a real problem if states aren't saving in good times because those revenues are particularly volatile. Um, in contrast with sales and property taxes, which are more traditionally more stable. Um, uh, other thing is that because the sources of revenue were varied and because we have so many local governments, we have particular governments that are going to face particular problems. And so the two types of governments that people are most worried about, one are transit agencies. So transit agencies get a substantial amount of their revenue from what we call the fare box, but just the tolls you pay to get onto the train or bus. Um, with work from home, people are – those governments are getting less and less revenue. Um, and this is going to mean they either need to cut back – or they need much more state funding. And you're starting to see these fights in a variety of places. And of course, cutbacks are bad for state politicians' other goals, like not do, not, not having too much greenhouse gases. Um, the other type of government that's going to face real problems are, gov are, are 
downtowns that have seen, again, for the same work from home reasons, are seeing real declines in commercial property values. And then uh, jurisdictions are often very highly reliant on commercial property taxes. That is to say, the taxes they get from downtown office buildings. And if those are worth less over time, then and they're usually taxed at a higher rate than residential property because office buildings don't vote, um, the um, this is going to put some real fiscal pressure on downtown centers. Um, and uh, so those two are the types of government that we're probably most worried about. In contrast, other types of revenues are still quite strong. So sales revenue, tax revenue has been pretty strong for the last couple of years um, as people have continued to buy lots of stuff. As you say, sales tax is strong. Employment numbers are still good in terms of that part of tax revenue and property values are holding steady. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, uh, so much of what happens with the revenue picture is due, uh, particularly for, for some states, is due to the high-end income taxes. So the very, very rich pay a lot more than others. Um, and uh, progressive tax systems, that's how they work. Um, uh, and so uh, on one hand, unemployment, on the other hand, the um, – like that, in for instance, during the COVID, the kind of high COVID, the fact that the stock market did so well was one of the reasons why states didn't have such as big budget holes as we thought, which then when the federal government added so much money was why their budgets have been so strong for the last couple of years. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the situation over the next four to eight years? It's a great question. So, I mean, what I guess I'd say is that I am, um, uh, I, you know, I'd say that I think there's going to be some really varied outcomes, that this huge boom should have created lots and lots of opportunities for to save for a rainy day. Um, and I think many jurisdictions did that. On the other hand, I think some jurisdictions did not. And so um, I am, uh, I, you know, I'm, I, I don't think this is going to look like uh, – the great the great depression type of problems you know like or anything like that and i don't think the economy is going to look like that but i do think we're going to see a number of real localized crises and, and and in any particular place or region yeah so this is not the the my business is is like understanding the kind of broad law and policy not what they call credit analysis where i'm like picking out this jurisdiction so you know i'm loath to you know loath to give investment advice in this way um uh but i mean i will say that the places that the the types of governments that we should be most worried about are the transit agencies the the big commercial the downtowns with lots of commercial property taxes and then the places that have come into it with the most debt and if you want to look at the places that have come into the most debt you're looking at your Illinois, New Jersey, and Illinois, New Jersey's of the world, and then particularly your Chicago's um, and a few other jurisdictions. And so those are where people generally are, the jurisdictions people are generally worried about. I'm not, you know, telling you to, you know, not buy municipal bonds anywhere. That's not, this is not investment advice. Um, but, you know, I, um, I, I do think that, uh, that um, what we're, you know, the, the old Warren Buffett line, which is when the tide comes in, we can see who's swimming with no underwear. Um, uh, we're going to find out. And of course, California, just uh, to put a cap on it, California has been interesting given that it had these huge surpluses and now uh, is facing potential deficits. It's a real, I mean, it's, I mean, California obviously is like in many ways, uh, it's, it's, it's like a giant country, except that it can't print money. Um, and so um, it's a, uh, it's what happens in California is obviously much more important than what happens to anything because it's just so much bigger. Um, uh, the, one thing I'd say, I mean, if I, you know, California obviously is this huge deficit. One thing I'll say is that places like California, and this is to a lesser extent true in, uh, for like for some cities like uh, New York, or not less true, it's as true for New York City, are in their own way sitting on this giant gold mine, but they're refusing to tap it. And so people want to live in California. You can tell because the property values are so high. And if California would really, really uncork housing development, you'd see um, a, a huge flow in. Uh, that would help stanch some of these kind of going uh, deficits coming forward. Um, uh, but that would require running over a lot of the opposition to new housing construction. And so one of the, if you want me to be optimistic, I'll be happy, which is that one of the hopes is that uh, pressure can force uh, political change of things that felt that were immovable 
Um, and so I'm one of the things I'm hoping for is that in jurisdictions that face real, real fiscal pressure, they are forced to do things that you know, would have made sense in other times as well, like uh, allowing more housing construction. David Schleicher, his book is in a bad state, responding to state and local budget crises. David, I thank you so very much for spending time with us here on the Who, What, Why podcast. And this was really, really, really fun. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for listening and joining us here on the Who, What, Why podcast. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.